Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Andres Martinez, and today I'm going to be talking uh, about causal inference in, in machine learning. Um, before to start, I'm going to say a few more words about my uh, background. I hold a PhD on software system and computer, uh, master on computer science, and uh, currently working in the Google Machine Learning Site Reliability Engineering Team at Google, uh, based in Zurich, and also member of uh, several um, professional organizations in the computer and engineering uh, side. You can find me in several social networks. You have the link here, including uh, the link to my GitHub repo, where you can find some of the code that we will present here uh, about causal inference. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about this talk because um, it's uh, the result of what I call a Feynman effect. Uh, probably many of you know Richard Feynman. Uh, and there is a very interesting story about uh, uh, this scientist. Uh, when he was young, after finishing um, his PhD, he spent some time trying to find what would be the next step for him. And at some point, he was uh, in the lab, I think, just uh, looking through the uh, window. It was raining. And he saw how um, the raining was, you know, in the glass, uh, forming some path. And um, just because he was bored, he decided to analyze how this path uh, were forming. And the truth is that after some iteration, that was one of the um, his biggest contribution to the to the science, and uh, it actually helped a lot to the quantum mechanic after some years. So the the lesson here is that when you are bored, when you don't know what to do, sometimes you uh, spend time doing things that apparently are not important and suddenly you realize that you find uh, something really interesting. In my case, um, the question was uh, more related to um, explore a new programming language, actually Kotlin. And I decided to uh, implement an algorithm that I found in a, in a paper. Uh, you will know the reference later, but uh, uh, the, the, the situation here is that, yes, because I decided to go for uh, learning a new programming language, um, I explore what is now a very hot topic in, in the computer science, in the artificial intelligence, and um, a really important topic for all of those people interested in uh, answering those questions. Uh, how artificial could an intelligent be? Uh, how much could a machine learn? Or how can we make uh, AI uh, much smarter? So um, obviously, I'm not going to answer all of this question in the full extension in this talk, but I will try to uh, do my best and uh, basically guide you through my own experience learning about this, these topics. So let's start with the first question. Um, so probably you are familiar with uh, different ways of testing intelligence. Um, actually, um, it was in the uh, 50s, uh, last century, when the Turing, Alan Turing introduced what is now, uh, now as a test uh, of Turing, Turing test, which basically introduced a binary uh, criteria to decide if uh, a system, a computer agent is or not uh, intelligent. So currently there are different competition uh, using um, this test to evaluate a system. And uh, the truth is that um, they are still struggling trying to uh, make a system appear like an intelligent um, agent. So in particular, currently they are a very well-known competition where four judges uh, evaluate um, using the you know, adult uh, standard criteria to evaluate uh, artificial intelligence. And in most of the cases, it's even difficult to, uh, you know, cheat to uh, even the half of the, of the judges. So in order to evaluate some of the new system, in particular, uh, causal uh, inference system, they were um, 
foreign initiative, but in particular, uh, one of the uh, fathers of the coastal inference introduced what is called a uh, mini Turing test. Well, still we use uh, this to evaluate two different um, streams, so intelligent or not intelligent, but in this case, we just uh, establish the criteria to uh, three years old human uh, kids, basically. So um, if we restrict to this uh, mini Turing test, also considering uh, the area of the casualty, uh, the truth is that we have systems currently uh, running which are able to, um, you know, uh, cheat to the judges and uh, look like a, a three years uh, whole uh, human. We will see more about this uh, in a second, but uh, uh, actually now um, we use a different way to evaluate uh, intelligence, which is also connecting with the um, uh, casual inference that we are discussing in this in this presentation. In particular, this uh, this test introduced uh, three levels, and um, if uh, basically used for uh, the evaluation of the uh, causal inference of the different uh, system. So starting in the basic level, L1, this is the level that you use to uh, connect information. So it's an associative level where uh, you uh, get information from the world around you and basically connect uh, using the correlation, if that is probably the, the right word, information from from your uh, from your work uh, this is what we do when we uh, observe when we uh, look at things and uh, it helps us to answer questions like uh, what if uh, if I see or um, how those variables are related or how uh, observing specific uh, um, causes or effects uh, change my belief of the of the work so most of the system that we are using right now, even uh, artificial intelligence solution, for sure robotics, but in particular, most of the artificial um, software that uh, we are using to provide some intelligence in our um, uh, system is are based on, on, on this level. So we are not able to, to get much more uh, than this. The truth is that when we go to the next level, uh, level two, in this uh, level, we are able to act. So um, we uh, do intervention in the sense of basically modifying uh, the war around us and observing uh, what it happened. But most than that, we are uh, changing the war around us in order to uh, get some uh, results. So we are able to be active in the sense of uh, modifying our surroundings. In particular, um, working at this level, we are able to answer questions like, uh, what if, if I do? So um, how can I get something done? Uh, what would be uh, why if I do X, for instance, or, or how can I make a Y happen? So this is uh, what most of the um, animals in some sense can do. So they can, uh, they are able to interact with the, the surroundings. And, in particular, the, this is something that uh, uh, um, you know monkeys and uh, primates uh, are able to to do in a very simple way. They are able to use tooling uh, in order to interact in a uh, active way in the world, trying to get things done. Um, currently, as I said, most of the system uh, don't work at this level, and only partially with a very restricted solution we are able to get this this level done. But, but what it makes um, the human be intelligent for some philosopher is actually the level three, where we are able to uh, imagine different situations. So in this case, we are not observing nothing real. We cannot act in anything real because actually this is the imagination level. But actually in some cases is uh, what make us basically go beyond the existing situation and introduce what for many people is, is intelligence. So we call this level uh, counterfactuals. Um, so in this case, we 
are able to imagine things, uh, to do retrospective and understanding of uh, what could be the alternative of the uh, different situations. So in particular, we are able to answer what if, if I had done or why, uh, was X the cause of Y? Uh, what if X has not occurred and things like that. So um, with these three levels, we realize once again that currently we don't have a way to implement this uh, interaction uh, in, in the artificial system. So we need to uh, basically consider this like a, a goal. But uh, it's very interesting to consider what happened next. So this is a very interesting uh, discussion. It's quite uh, philosophical. But uh, if L3 is the, the human level, what happened with the next level? This is what some people call superintelligence. And yes, I got some interesting detail here. There are some um, results in the um, computational theory area that says that we don't really uh, are able to compute if the system is a super intelligence. So that makes in some sense uh, because uh, it's beyond our scope. We are not able to identify what is more intelligent than, than a human. So again, this is kind of a interesting detail uh, in the area of uh, computational theory. But you have here some uh, links. So if you like these topics, you can get uh, through this link and get more information about this, this discussion. So um, considering this way to measure intelligence and what is the current status, um, let's try to see how much uh, could a machine learn. So at the end, we are implementing different solutions. If you know about artificial intelligence, probably you realize that we are switching from uh, perception, machine learning techniques to a uh, logic system or expert system. And now actually there is a very nice combination uh, called uh, neurosymbolic uh, computation that we are trying to get more combining both approaches. But let's start with a very simple uh, way to learn from from the data so probably you uh, recognize this this formula this is a simple uh, linear uh, formula that we use for a linear regression it was in the 19th century legrand and uh, gauss uh, at the beginning of the century they introduced this uh, less square uh, approach where basically we were um, evaluating the differences between uh, linear expression and the data that we were collecting from um, the, the reality, from the, the, the surroundings. So the thing is that even though this is very simple and we have been using it the different ways uh, for a couple of centuries, the truth is that this approach has some, some limitations. In particular, there are some uh, funny ones. Um, this is coming from an actual um, report that so it was uh, illustrated in, in different medias, but in particular, there were someone connecting uh, crime with the uh, ice cream. So apparently, um, the murderer used to eat a lot of uh, ice cream. So there was a positive correlation uh, between uh, both things. So as you probably know, correlation doesn't mean uh, causation. So um that is pretty obvious for uh, people with technical or scientist uh, background but uh, um, not for everyone and still we see a lot of researches and papers where you can find these kind of flaws because people um, misunderstand both terms uh, you can see here a uh, formula where i already introducing what is called uh, do calculus but at the end what it's trying to say is that obviously um, because uh, these data are not really uh, connected, it doesn't mean that if we uh, reduce the consume of ice cream, we are going to see less crime. So we don't get uh, that power because there is no causal relation between crime and ice cream. So if there is no relation, why this is happening? So um, here you have a more technical, uh, let's say, presentation of the same um, situation where I am comparing uh, the two level of the um, intelligence that I presented before, association and intervention. And you can see that another a real example, but actually uh, quite um, 
sometimes difficult to understand. So in this particular case, you see how uh, uh, exercise increases uh, cholesterol, which is, uh, again, something uh, against our understanding of most of the people. The truth is that because uh, in this information, we are uh, basically presenting data um, for all the um, ages. So people with different ages behave in a different way. And that means that age affects to the uh, exercise that you do and also affects to the cholesterol. So that is what we represent below with this uh, casual diagram. And uh, uh, in order to solve this situation, what we do is basically establish or uh, fix uh, age in this case and analyze how these variables are related for a specific age. So you can see that approach in the uh, in the diagram in the, the right. Um, but uh, that is something that you cannot get from the data. That is something that you have to basically analyze from the uh, causal diagram and then um, process the data to, to be sure that you are understanding properly. So um, at the end, um, current uh, artificial intelligence uh, has some limitation or scenarios for development. Actually, you can see here a source of uh, flow limitation. And so I encourage you to, to take a look at this uh, repository. Uh, and you will find a lot of uh, ways to uh, improve or for, for improve. And in particular, um, Agile is, um, I, sorry, AI is one of the uh, uh, most fragile uh, solution um, in the technology because you change the situation really a little bit. Uh, the, the, the results are really, really uh, uh, bad. And in particular, this is important when you're trying to make decisions because those decisions are changing the surrounding. So um, sometimes this a connection makes uh, uh, the fragility of the AI uh, really a, a problem to uh, make decisions regarding your uh, you know, uh, surroundings. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have a way to uh, understand where um, the decision point for AI. So uh, AI doesn't like uh, whys. Um, sometimes you introduce bias because uh, you remember too much the history. So you are quite uh, connected with the data that you use to train the system. And this is a limiting factor. And uh, well, same for math and logic or when you're trying to remember, uh, you know, a long time uh, a series of uh, information. So at the end, again, those limitations as are connected because we are not using casual inference in, in uh, many of the situations uh, that we face with artificial intelligence these days. So how can it be uh, smarter? So at the end, uh, there are many ways. As I mentioned, we are trying to combine uh, perception with uh, uh, um, symbolic analysis with this neurosymbolic approach. But one of the areas that uh, currently a lot of researchers and uh, technologists are using is what we call um, causal formulation. So this is, a, I would say, quite simple approach in the sense of the formulation, uh, but it provides something that we didn't have before, which is a way to represent dependencies between uh, data. So using the example that I presented before, you can see here that the age is affecting exercise and cholesterol. So what we have to do in order to analyze the dependencies and make decision is basically fix um, uh, the analysis for a, 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 a concrete age. So we uh, are able to uh, remove that dependencies of the data, uh, providing a proper analysis context. For the ice cream, the situation is, is similar. In particular, um, what we see here is that the temperature, the temperature is uh, what is producing um, the, the increase of uh, ice cream consumption and also the crime. So if we fix uh, that data, uh, we realize that there is no actual connection between uh, both things. And this is because uh, with this casual um, formulation, we are introducing two important things. One is uh, uh, the casual diagram that you, you can see here, which is a way to represent the, the uh, knowledge. And then uh, using this uh, formulation that you can see also here, we do uh, what is called the calculus, which is just a algebraic formulation uh, that defines uh, uh, the query language. So we are able to build those uh, 
those diagrams to formalize the knowledge and then query them uh, using new calculus. The important thing here is that um, we can analyze from the topological point of view the structure of the, of the graphs and we can uh, infer causal connection uh, from the data which is really important because, again, before we went, uh, we were not able to, to do this, this kind of things. And the, the second important result is that um, with the proper analysis and uh, in some specific situation, we can infer uh, level two and three information just from the observational data that we have at the level one. So um, this is very interesting result because again, we can have a proper way to build those diagram and introduce as a part of the, um, of the system. So in particular, uh, the diagram has a very simple structure. There are three uh, fundamental uh, components that we call mediator. So one effect is acting in a cause through a mediator. Uh, B would be here. We have a, a fork structure where we have uh, a common effect uh, affecting two causes. And we have a collider where we have uh, two effects uh, producing uh, the same cause. With this uh, basic structure, we can build almost uh, any uh, causal structure in what is called direct acyclic graph. So this, this is just a graph with some um, um, characteristic that we can use to analyze um, the causal information. So in this example that you have here, um, we are using what is called uh, the separation to, let's say, hide uh, a lot of information of the causal uh, diagram to uh, simplify the uh, analysis of the uh, G in this case, just yes, uh, considering the uh, effect of their uh, father in, in the fathers in the, in the in the graph, so this is going to be a, a way to basically simplify all this diagram, and actually it will be uh, used for uh, the proper definition of the uh, causal inference and genes. So in this particular uh, example, what we are going to do is to connect uh, a pre-existing uh, causal model, and then to implement a, a query. Uh, and gene that we use to get to get decision. So um, we are not going to discuss about the, the modeling and testing of the casual diagram. This is quite complex uh, situation in the general terms. But let me tell you, yes, uh, these are uh, Bayesian network that we can use to uh, represent a joint distribution and get some uh, inference uh, knowledge from, from the analysis. So a Bayesian network are, by definition, um, really complex to represent and to, and to define. But still, we will see in a second there are some simplification that, that we can do in order to um, get uh, the details of this uh, joint distribution. In particular, using uh, this separation, we can basically um, um, obtain the parameters of the joint distribution because we are hiding uh, random impact and also uh, the rest of the diagram and focusing only on the um, immediate um, dependencies of the of the specific cause. Um, more than that, we can use this situation to validate data that we are obtaining from the uh, from the uh, experiment. So. Um, in the best case, we are able to basically um, obtain and validate this uh, function, but it, the, the data doesn't support um, the, um, the inference. We can run uh, randomized control experiments to add more information. Um, this is always an option, but because they are really expensive, and well, actually, in some cases, they are not option to run this, this experiment. Um, so we, we can try to have a, a basically constructive or step-by-step -step process to build this, this diagram. So once we have this diagram, there are different ways to implement the uh, inference in genes. In particular, um, TensorFlow provides an uh, extension, what is called TensorFlow probability, that you can use to uh, change um, neural um, network Bayesian uh, um, 
distribution, um, but also represent the structural time series. So this is quite a simple approach, but it's based in TensorFlow. So if you are familiar with, with TensorFlow, that might be an option. Um, there is a quite nice end-to-end uh, -end, uh, library for Python uh, that allow you to uh, solve the entire uh, uh, inference um, engine, including the evaluation of the, of the model. And then uh, what I did was to implement a few uh, algorithms uh, using Kotlin um, and then following a specific structure, which is called uh, probability trees. It's a simplification of a uh, Bayesian network, but allow you to uh, experiment with this causal inference in, in some particular cases. As I said, this was uh, the, the initial motivation, and then I realized uh, about all of this, uh, all of these things. So um, regarding the probability trees, I'm going to go very fast. You can see the code in, in the repo in, in GitHub, but uh, just to uh, provide some hints, uh, you have here the, the reference to the paper where they introduced the, the pseudo code and the main um, features of this uh, way to uh, process uh, uh, causal inference. Uh, in particular, you can do uh, propositional calculus and uh, uh, causal precedent, which is quite powerful um, because it's based in, in trees. It's a very simple way to distribute. You can uh, implement a solution based in um, horizontal scale um, implementation of, of this inference. And uh, at the end, it's, it's a very simple way to, to process these uh, inference uh, models. Um, and in particular, you can do all the analysis from the very basic level to the counterfactual, which is the maximums, as you, as you saw in the uh, scale of the causality. So, um, the definition is uh, recursive, and uh, you can see here there is a path connecting every single uh, event of the joint distribution, which is a path from the root to the leaf. Um, so it's a very compact uh, way to uh, represent the uh, causal information. And again, you can distribute in different nodes uh, if you need it. Um, you can do here uh, analysis of the entire uh, structure of the of the ladder of the causality and in particular um, you have here um, ways to get the event connecting every single um, variable of the joint distribution i'm presenting here the pseudo code because um, there were some bugs in in the paper so you can basically, if you want to implement using your uh, preferred uh, programming language, you can go uh, and uh, fix those bugs uh, in the paper. But uh, again, we can analyze um, what is uh, a situation where uh, a set, for instance, in this case, uh, precede uh, Y um, in the in the in the tree, and uh, this is a recursive algorithm. You can also uh, answer a question like a, um, association of the different uh, um, variables, like a standard correlation analysis, but also uh, intervention. And again, you can see uh, the code in in the repo. You have the link to, uh, at the end of the uh, the presentation. So before finishing. Um, I would like to share with you a few papers that I used to implement some of this algorithm. Another uh, interesting next step, in particular, how uh, some uh, teams are using Bayesian neural networks to try and to introduce a more complex structure in the existing uh, neural networks. And what could be next step for some uh, solutions. And then, yes, to present how complex is uh, the evaluation of the uh, data. Um, you have here a sequence of numbers that uh, the, the, the game is trying to find what is, uh, uh, this is about. Uh, take a look at this uh, reference because there are some details there. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, all what I would like to uh, present today. Thank you for your uh, for being here, and then I don't know if we have any question.
Okay, it seems that we don't have question and uh, time is uh, off. So thank you all for attending. I hope you enjoyed and thank you the organization for having me.